Darkcast Network, indie pods with a dark side. Hello and welcome back to Fuck That. This week, I am covering the second part of the murder of Stephanie, a.k.a. Stacy Wasilishin. But before I get into a recap of what happened in part one, I wanted to give a shout out to a couple of different people that are listeners and sent me some really nice messages. Hi, Allie. Hi, Corey. And hello, Corey's wife. I'm sorry he didn't mention your name, but he did say that you guys both listen and I wanted to say thank you. You are all the shit, and I love you. Not in a creepy way. In part one, I mentioned how on the night of July 9th, 1993, Stacy was shot in her home. Initially, in the 911 call, Russell stated that he was not sure if he pulled the trigger, if she pulled the trigger. He did tell police that there was an altercation between the two. Stacy had walked out into the living room while he was sitting on the couch and said that she was going to shoot him. She proceeded to allegedly fire the gun with one hand. Remember her left hand, which is her non-dominant hand. She then walked into the bedroom and for some unknown reason, he decided to follow her. Initially, he stated that there was a fight for the gun between the two. The gun discharged and Stacy died. This story is going to change as well as a lot of other details of Russell's story. So I am going to start with Russell's first interview that he gives at the police department at 542 in the morning. Detective Walter Spokes from Sedona, as well as investigator Gary Saravo with the Yavapai County Attorney's Office, are conducting the interview. Russell is read his rights and he is informed that he is not under arrest and that he is giving them his statement and answering questions willingly and he also states that he is not under the influence at all and that he is completely sober at the time of this interview. They ask about his relationship with Stacy, and he says that they have been together for six years, they have been living together for six years, and that they have two children. He does specify that the younger child is his with Stacy and that Nikki, the older sister, is from Craig, who is Nikki's father. Now police say to Russell, okay, why don't we start with yesterday? He says, okay. They ask, what time did you guys get up? He said, yesterday we got up 1130. They ask again, 1130. He says 1130, quarter to 12. They ask if they both got up at the same time, Stacy and Russell. He says, yes. And then they say, why don't you go through the events of the day for me? I'm going to skip through a lot of the first part of this transcript because he is just reiterating things we know about the fact that he and Stacy both work at the same place. He states that they both got in around 12, 1230. However, again, Stacy left at about 530, quarter to six. Russell left around 11 o'clock that night. He then states that he came home and took a shower. They ask, you came home. Was there any problems at work yesterday? He said, no, none whatsoever. They say, okay. So she left about 5.30, you say? He confirms. They ask a few more clarifying questions about the times, and then they say, okay, why don't we get into details now about what happened then? And then Russell says, the details is, I come home, I give her a kiss, I go over everything, and she has a tendency sometimes to be a little aggressive because she's home with the kids all day. So I go into the shower, I come back out, we sit and talk, we go to bed, and the next morning happens. They say, okay, what happened last night? Russell says, you're talking about this night? They say this night or last night. Before I get into his response, I just want to note two things that I found to be really strange during this interaction. The first is that, in my opinion, there is only one night that the police are referring to, and it is the night where Stacy was shot. So I found it very peculiar that Russell answered with the night before and This is just purely speculation on my part, but Russell is an intelligent man, and I think that he knew the night that they were talking about, so I thought it was very strange that he talked about a night that has absolutely nothing to do with why he's in the police station. The second thing that I thought was really strange, and I guess what I mean by strange is I think it was intentional, is that even though he's talking about a night where nothing happens, and they go to bed, and according to him, everything is peaceful, 
he goes out of his way to plant a little seed in the officer's brains that Stacy is aggressive. So after this absolutely ridiculous little back and forth between Russell and the investigators, clarifying which night they are asking about, Russell then provides the answer. Russell stated that he got a ride home, he gets home, and Stephanie was waiting on the couch. He says, I get home, I give Steffi a little kiss. They ask if Stacy is sitting on the couch, and he confirms. He says, she's sitting on the couch, I have a bottle of wine, I have a bottle of Jordan Cabernet, I go into the shower, I take a shower. And they ask if he had the bottle of wine before he showered, and Russell says, I brought it home with me from the restaurant. They ask, did you drink it and take a shower or just brought it home? Russell said, no, I brought it home. I set it on the table. She had already had, she had already been drinking, whatever it was. So I go into the shower. I come back out. They ask, what time are we talking about? He said, at this time, we're talking about 11.15, 11.30. He continues, I'm sitting next to her on the couch. I open the bottle of wine. She has a glass. I have a glass. We drink it and there becomes a confrontation. She tells me that she spoke with Nikki's father. They ask some clarifying questions about Nikki's father and he continues. So she tells me that she's been talking, that she talked with him for about two hours, two and a half hours, whatever it was, and that she had a nice conversation with him. Fine and dandy. No big deal. It becomes a little confrontational. They ask why and he says, I don't know why. I think it seems pretty obvious, at least on my part, that there was a confrontation because Stacy was talking to her ex-husband, Nikki's father, for two and a half hours. What do you think happened to your mother that night? My dad's story has remained the same since the day he got custody of me about a week later. My mom and my dad talked at 8.06 that night. She will call him. She will bitch about the fact that Russell's been neglecting her. He's going out of town that weekend to a culinary thing for, you know, uh, two weeks, and he's taking some of her Disneyland money for this summer. Oh, that really pissed her off. So as the night's progressing, she's drinking, talking first to my aunt, drinking, then calling my dad, reiterating the story. Then um, the only difference between any other night and this night was that my dad and his girlfriend at the time, Betty, they had been together for years. They were broke up, and he had a big empty house. And so my mom calls him bitching about how unhappy she is. He goes, why don't you just come on back, Stacy? Let's give it another try. That shifted the whole conversation. Like my mom and my dad never talked for 107 minutes. She'd call him, you know, 20, 30 minutes, talk about money. I would catch up with him on the phone. But the whole second hour shifted to making plans on moving back when Russell was out of town that weekend. And then to dirty talk. My dad has always been so specific on the fact that my mom was extra super dirty on that phone call. And he has held firm to the story that Russell, she told him that Russell was recording her phone calls because he knew that she was cheating on him. So my mom was like, I know Russell's listening and I don't give a fuck if he hears me do this, this and this to you. She knew he was listening and that telephone call and her, him coming home and listening to that, what tripped the trigger and why he grabbed the gun and the fact that she was going to take his kid. That was always the threat. She always did threaten, like, I'm going to leave you and I'm going to take your kid. And I think that was just what broke it for him and why he grabbed the gun. So after Russell says he doesn't know why it became confrontational, investigators ask, on your part or her part? To which Russell says, on her part, I don't know why. You know what it is? I was accepted. I was the ninth or 10th accepted to go to Cornell University. Ever heard of it? I have zero ability to say Cornell University without saying ever heard of it because I'm a big Office fan. So Russell didn't say that, but Andy did. So he says he was ninth or 10th accepted. And then he goes, we can go to my house right now. I can show you my plane tickets, my agenda. I'm going there for a taste of the Cordon Bleu, which is a professional advanced program for chefs. They ask, where is that? He says, that's in Ithaca, New York. They ask where the things are at the house. And he says it's sitting on the mantle, plane tickets and everything. He then continues, and ever since she knew about that, she's felt like, well, why you and not me? Investigators ask, did she apply or do you have, you have to understand, I'm not a chef. He then says, no, 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 what I mean, I've done this for 15 years. They ask if he had to apply for this and he said, I applied for that. I called them up. I saw it in a magazine. I called them up. They sent me an application. I filled it out. I sent back my application and after being reviewed, because I mean, it's a $4,000 course, just because you may have the money to pay for it doesn't mean you're accepted. They want professional people. So I get a call back. Russell, you've been accepted. I won't say it's created a confrontation, but it's been, like I just said, you know, well, why you? Why not me? 
Well, you know, for 15 years, I basically learned this from the get-go. No formal training. No nothing. They again ask, after he is arrogantly boasting about his experience and how he got in, if Stacy applied. And he said, no, she did not apply. And so I was accepted and I am supposed to leave. My father is going to come and pick me up or is supposed to come and pick me up Saturday. I leave at 1130 at night, Saturday night. They ask if it's a two week course and he confirms. Then they say, all right, well, it's not like you're going to be gone for. And he says, no, it's a two week course. They say, okay. And he again says, it's a two week course. Investigators circle back to clarify when and how things became confrontational to which Russell responds with very minute. And then he says, I mean, it all depends on kind of how she is at any given point in time. For the most part, we were very stable. And I, for the life of me, I swear to God, I don't know why she went into the bedroom. Investigators stop him and they want to go back to the shower and after he showers. And they specifically say step by step. So Russell says, we talk. She's on the left-hand side. I'm in the center of the couch. We're talking. We're talking. It becomes a little heated, but nothing that a relationship hasn't had happen in the past. So I didn't think anything of it. I got this 44 Magnum that my father gave to me as a gift for over two and a half years. It sits up in the closet. I've only ever taken it out once to go shooting, which is a like lower Red Rock Loop Road. He then goes on about his experiences shooting there and they ask if it was loaded and he says, yes, it is completely loaded. It had a hollow point Benacci Italian bullets in it. And she goes into the bed. She goes into the bedroom. When she comes back out, she's got she has the gun in her hand and she cocks it back and she goes, Russell, I'm going to shoot you. And I put my hands up and said, Steph, why? What are you talking about? And I don't think her intentions truly were to shoot me as opposed to maybe a fright tactic. Investigators ask, what did you think at this point in time? I mean, do you think she's just screwing around or do you think what is going on here? Or you tell me what your state of mind is. He says, no. I've been with her for six years, so I kind of felt that she was screwing around, maybe a little more than screwing around because it's been sitting up there untouched, and now she goes and picks it up. I mean, she's got the hammer cocked back, and she's got it pointed at me. He specifies again to investigators that he's sitting in the center of the couch, and he says, okay, so now she fires it, and like I said, I wouldn't be here if it would have hit me. I'm sure you saw the bullet in the curtains, wherever it hit, in the wall. Investigators ask, did she fire it at you, or about you, or... And he says, above me. They ask again if he thought it was intentional. And Russell says, it was probably purposely above. If she wanted to hit me, she would have hit me. And he said, yeah. Uh, at that point, I said, Steph, what are you crazy? I mean, what's the matter with you? And she goes walking into the back, into the bedroom, and she cocks it back again. And she says, Russell, I'm going to kill you. They ask where he was at this time. And he says, at this time, I get off the couch and I am following her into the hallway, into the bedroom. And we're talking as she is standing right in front of the closet. And, you know, after having one ring above my head and everything else, I grabbed her hand and we struggled a little bit. And the next thing I know, it went off and she dropped. And at first I thought it was, I don't know what went through my mind. Knowing it was accidental. Yes. Thinking that it's really not true. Yes. And I look down at her and I see her face on the ground and, and I see blood. They ask how Stacy was faced at that time, and he says she was face down on the ground, kind of on her side, with her legs somewhat up to her chest. And I looked at her, and I didn't believe what happened. I did not believe what happened, and I, I panicked. Investigators ask him to back up and they specify you go into the bedroom and she cocks the hammer again. He said it was already cocked. And she said, I'm going to shoot you again. He said, yes. I mean, we love each other. I mean, you can talk to people. You can do whatever you want to do. We have a very, we had whatever, a good and semi bad relationship. Just how relationships go. And after the first time, I mean, the gun was never grabbed before. I've known her for six years. I mean, it sat up there for a year and a half and it was never grabbed before. They again ask, did you go into the bedroom? He says, yes. They ask, did you see her? Did you hear her? How did you know? Russell said, how do I know? Because after she shot the first time and I said, Steph, what's the matter with you? She cocked it again the second time and she turned around and walked into the bedroom. And investigators say, okay, and you followed her there? And he said, yes. And then they said, okay, then what happened? Detailed, real detailed. They specify that they want to know how Russell's facing, how's everybody facing, what is said, everything. Russell says, I can't tell you exactly what was said. We were standing in front of the closet. We were facing each other and she has the gun. And they ask, in which hand? 
And this is a really important detail. His answer is, oh my God, she's right-handed. It had to be her right hand. It had to be her right hand. And she's kind of pointing it around to a certain extent. If you remember, according to the medical examiner, there was zero evidence of any traces of gunpowder residue in Stacy's right hand. They want Russell to clarify. So they say, point it at you or not at you. And he said, well, I mean, at me, at the, I mean, just pointing it around. And I grabbed her. They ask, how did you grab her? He said, I grabbed her by the wrist. They say by the wrist. He said, yes. And there was a struggle. Investigators ask, how long was the struggle? To which Russell replied, it couldn't have been more than 15 seconds, 20 seconds. Investigators ask if he went to the ground. Did he hit the bed? Russell says, no, we never hit the ground. They ask, just right there in front of the closet? He said, just right there in front of the closet. We never hit the ground. They again ask some more clarifying questions about the position. And Russell said, we were standing straight up. Obviously, there was going to be some kind of struggle. It happened so fast. It happened so fast. It was never meant to happen. It happened so fast. It shouldn't have been. Investigators then specifically ask what happened to make the struggle happen. Was he trying to get the gun away from her? What was going on? And he doesn't answer the question. Instead, he kind of goes off about something else. And he says, I don't know. I can honestly look at you and tell you, I don't know whatever possessed her to pick it up in the first place. I don't know. Investigators then correct him and say, that's not what we're fucking asking. They didn't say the F word, but I did. They were asking what exactly he was trying to do that caused the struggle. So they ask, were you trying to pick it up from her hand? And he clarifies, yes, I was trying to get it out of her hand. They ask with one hand on her wrist, both hands. And he said, I honestly can't tell you that. I can think back and say, I know exactly how we were. I don't know. All I know is that it went off again and she dropped. Investigators then ask if he had touched the gun after, to which Russell said, yes, I did. I picked her up by her head. Oh, my God. And after that, I said to myself, she's got to be hurt bad. Here is the rest of Russell's statement in that passage in his own words. I didn't know what to do, and I didn't want to be accused of, of, of murder, of anything like that. Picked up the gun, I put it in the holster, I put it back in the closet, I brought it back down, and I said, no, I mean, that's stupid. I mean, it, it, it's happened. There's nothing that can, you can do about it at this point. And I set it back on the ground, So they asked if the holster was on the floor. He said, yes, I put it in the holster. I put it back up in the closet. Then he specifies that he put it up on the shelf. He says 15, 20 seconds passed. I took it back out of the holster, set it on the ground, and I called 911. The interview continues and several questions later, they ask, did she go in there and shoot herself? And he said, no, I won't say she shot herself and I won't say I shot her. The investigators ask, but it happened during the struggle? He said, yes, during our struggle, right in front of the closet. Then investigators ask, okay, what was the gun when it went off in relationship to you and her? I think they meant to say, where was the gun in relation to you and her? They then specify waist high, head high, in between you. Were you close together or far apart? And this is what Russell said to that question in his own words. No, we were not far apart. We were close together. Uh, I can't give you exacts on that. It all happened so fast. I, I don't know. I mean, we were there. There was a struggle. Next thing I know, there was a pop and she dropped. Russell's second interview occurred again with Detective Spokes and Detective Gary Saravo. And that interview occurred on July 10th at 3.21 in the afternoon. Investigators had asked Russell if Stacy had ever threatened him before, and he specified that the only time Stacy ever threatened him was in relation to their daughter and threatening to leave and take the children with her. Then investigators kind of do something that I perceive to be leading, and they kind of poke and pry at that and insist that they've heard comments of Stacy specifically making very specific threats that are physical threats towards Russell. And then Russell's like, yeah, she's threatened me like that before. Something else that I thought was interesting regarding this second interview with Russell is they start to ask about an incident that allegedly did get slightly violent between Russell and Stacy. But and this doesn't occur anywhere else in these documents. The main page where this information is housed is not included in the reports that were given to Nikki that she then gave to me for this case. 
it goes from page five to page seven. So for whatever reason, that entire page is redacted. What I can tell you is he's talking about how his eye was scratched because this is the only thing I can read. But he does say, I will not. And I will sit here and say, I will not blame that on her. That was not her. I'm not blaming that on me. I'm necessarily saying that was a case from what I can remember where our daughter, I picked her up, her arms went and it hit me in the cornea of the eye. Investigators then say, so you don't recall her attacking you. And Russell says, no, I won't say Stephanie attacked me. Not at all. So again, I'm not really sure what was redacted in that one page, but it is interesting that that is the one redacted page in all of the documents. And the only thing that I can see is Russell refuses to blame Stacy for the incident. In fact, he seems to make it seem as though it was an accident. Something that I think is really important to note is that this is the interview and it gets even more dramatic in his subsequent interviews where Russell's story really starts to change. And again, this is just one day after the incident. Investigators ask, do you feel you were impaired at that time? Russell replied, I feel I might have been slightly impaired at that time. And so as I walked, it all happened so fast. I mean, you guys have the ability to check the powder residue or whatever. The gun was never in my hand. There may or may not have been a scuffle, as I think we might have scuffled a little bit, and then it went off, and then she dropped. I am going to now reread an excerpt from his statement from the day before. I grabbed her by the wrist, and there was a struggle. One of the things that I noticed in Russell's interviews across the board, starting from his first interview transcript at Sedona Police Department the day prior, all the way to the last interview transcript, is that his answers are never clear. What I mean by that is investigators simply asked him if he felt he was impaired at the time. He then goes on to talk about their ability to check gunpowder residue. He states that the gun was never in his hand. There may or may not have been a scuffle. And this is uniform with almost all of his answers. There is often a correlation between suspects that are guilty and when they are giving their alibi and the fact that they tend to provide more details in their statements. I am going to provide the information to this in the show notes, but according to a thesis that was actually published by the DOJ on their website, and it's titled Alibi Generation and Discriminability, they investigated several differences between those that were innocent and guilty and when they gave their alibis. But one of the things that they looked at was speech duration. And according to their research, quote, alibi providers spoke significantly longer when reporting their deceptive alibi compared to when reporting their honest alibi. Something else that I thought was interesting in this study is that they explored how the evaluators perceived the alibi provider's behavior. And this revealed that deceptive alibi providers were perceived to be significantly more helpful and friendly compared to the honest and accurate alibi providers. Additionally, deceptive alibi providers were also perceived as being significantly more confident and fluent compared to honest and accurate alibi providers. And again, this is me just speculating, but I do think it's really interesting to think about how detailed almost way too detailed Russell is in all of his statements. But regardless of how detailed he is, he makes several mistakes and contradictions that are either not noticed by police or police just don't bother to give a shit. I had mentioned prior to talking about this study that one of the biggest discrepancies that I noticed off the bat between the July 10th and the July 9th interview was he said that there was a struggle on the 9th and then on the 10th he was like, ah, oh, maybe there was, maybe there wasn't. There is another big discrepancy, and it involves the holster of the gun. On the 9th, Russell stated that he picked up the gun. I put it in the holster. I put it back up in the closet. Investigators asked, where was the holster at? Russell stated the holster was on the floor. The holster was on the floor. On the 10th, reading directly from the transcript, Russell states, so I looked down, and like I told you before, I picked up the gun. I put it in the closet. Investigators asked, where was the holster? Russell states, I think the holster, the holster was either in the closet or it could have been on the bed. The police are then asking more questions to try to figure out the placement where Stacy was, where Russell was. And they're asking about where Stacy was specifically in relation to the television that was in the bedroom. Investigators then ask, OK, what happens then? She still got the gun. Russell says, yes. Investigators say, which hand? Russell says, I don't know. On July 9th, investigators asked Russell that same question, to which he replied with, Oh my God, she's right-handed. It had to be a right hand. It had to be a right hand. 
Further along in the interview, investigators ask Russell if he ever had possession of the gun, and he stated, I never had possession of the gun. The only time I took possession of the gun when she fell down, and I looked down, and I saw what happened, and I saw the gun. It was sitting next to her. I got very nervous. I did not know what to do. I picked it up, put it in the closet. I put it in the holster. No, I put it in the closet, the holster. It does not make sense. I put it back down, and I called 911. I said there had been a very bad accident. I do not know what happened between July 9th and July 10th. I suspect that Russell had conversations with family members and friends because it is at this point in the interview on July 10th that Russell changes the trajectory of the investigation. The day before on July 9th, investigators explicitly ask, did she go in there and shoot herself? And Russell firmly states, no, I won't say she shot herself and I won't say I shot her. Investigators asked if it happened during a struggle, and Russell said, during our struggle. Investigators then ask, did she shoot herself? And Russell again gives his word salad, super fluffy answer. This answer actually reminds me of this viral video from years ago. And if you've seen it, it is on par. So I think it's like a Miss America competition or something. And I believe the contestant was either North or South Carolina. And the question was something to the effect of, a lot of Americans don't know how to read maps. Why do you think that is? And she goes, I personally believe that U.S. America, the Americans cannot read maps because uh, and she just gives like this ridiculous answer. So Russell says, I believe in my own mind after having a day to sleep. It just reminds me of that answer. So he believes in his own mind after having a day to sleep that after she had pointed at me and I said to her, look, Stephanie, what's going on? What is this? That she took the shot and there was from that point no hesitation to like turn around, walk and go right into the bathroom. I think she committed suicide. Keep in mind that the medical examiner ruled this as a homicide and that gunpowder residue was only found on her left hand, which was her non-dominant hand. and. It would require a lot of maneuvering and force on Stacy's part to be able to fire that gun and pull that trigger in that manner. I am keeping a tally, and I don't know if any of you are as well, of the contradictions that Russell has made, and so far we are up to four. Now, on August 3rd, 1993, Investigator Saravo from the Yavapai County Attorney's Office, Nancy Wilson of Sedona, and Officer Spokes of Sedona attempted to replicate the events of July 9th. I'm going to read directly from this narrative. It says, quote, on about 8-3-93, investigator Saravo, Nancy Wilson, and myself met in my office at the Sedona Police Department. Miss Wilson's arms and hands were measured and corresponded with the victim's measurements. Using a handgun of the same model and size, we attempted to simulate the victim firing the weapon. We were unable to have Miss Wilson pull the trigger when we attempted to obtain the same angle of entry. Miss Wilson had difficulty in pulling the trigger when the gun was fired, one-handed, double action. We were able to have the gun discharge when Investigator Saravo struggled with Miss Wilson. This is a very important piece of information because it proves that Stacy could not have fired the gun one-handed at Russell in the living room, and it means that she couldn't have shot herself one-handed. This made me ask myself, why then did Russell explicitly state in a variation of ways that he handled the gun after Stacy was already dead? First of all, that's just weird, right? You have somebody, be it an accident, suicide, or homicide, is now laying on the floor dead. Literally every single person on the planet knows to not touch the weapon. So why would Russell make it a point to tell investigators multiple times that he handled the weapon? I think it is to explain the fact that his fingerprints were on the gun because if there was no struggle and Stacy did actually kill herself, he would have to give some form of explanation. But as we can see here by what the medical examiner said and with what they tried to just replicate, according to that narrative at the Sedona Police Department, it is highly unlikely, if not impossible, that Stacy shot herself intentionally, completing suicide one-handed. 
on August 17th, Spokes and Saravo met with the coroner at the medical examiner's office, and Dr. Keene advised them that it was his opinion that Stacy was in a defensive posture when she was shot. He further stated that the gunpowder residue located on the palm of Stacy's left hand solidified this determination. He also noted that, again, Stacy was right-handed. Russell's third interview occurred on September 3rd, 1993, at 5.42. Investigators asked him to go over the events and they said, let's start when you last talked to Stacy. Russell said she called me three times and between 10 o'clock and 1115 when I actually left. And it was very odd. The fact that she, you know, I mean, once, OK, when you're coming home to call me again, when you're coming home and to the repetition of it after the fact leads me to believe, which I have believed from the start, that the conversation, something went on with the conversation. I'll give you my telephone bill with that she had with Craig, and she called him back at 1120, which is approximately when I did walk in the door. Mind you, this specific detail is something that he has never mentioned in his interviews. The fact that she called him and inundated him with phone calls between 10 and 1115. Something that I noticed about this specific interview is Russell really hones in on the fact that Stacy and Craig, Nikki's father, had a phone call, and he talks about it a lot. So he mentioned it in what I just read, and then they asked for the bill copy, and he said, I'll give it to you. And they're like, okay. Then Russell said, so the there was something that there was no reason for after our two-hour conversation, which was highly unusual. There was no reason for her to really have to call back to call back to confirm something. They specify this is calling Craig back. And he says, yes, I feel that the act I for no, I can't forgive her for wanting to kill me. But I feel that the act was premeditated because the gun that I had that I have that you guys have was in a place and in such a place on the second shelf of the closet underneath clothes behind this thing that the time that she took to get up to go into the bedroom, to come back out of the bedroom. And the last words I ever heard out of your mouth were, Russell, I'm going to kill you. You're not tall enough to get it. You didn't leave your, it was put somewhere where it was more accessible to her. Uh, uh, I don't know what else I can tell you. I'm not even going to comment on that because I'm sure all of you that are listening are all collectively like I am. Like, what the fuck does that even mean? It sounds like a bunch of bullshit. He continues, and in this account, he's again adding details two months later that he has never mentioned before, but they suddenly seem really important. Russell says, I come, I sit down. Russell, you fucking stink. Her basic language. She was kind of hardcore, not kind of, very hardcore, straightforward. Coming home from work, fine. I had a bottle of Jordan wine because I knew that uh, in less than 30 hours, a culmination of 15 years of work. I was accepted to Ithaca, New York, to go to the taste of the Cordon Bleu. It was paid for, the tickets there. The restaurant bought me a fucking $1,300 seven knives to go with me. Again, another detail he never mentioned before. Uh, my gains were like her losses. My achievements were a piece that would probably, something that she couldn't accept. And all I wanted to do was have sex that night. I just, I, can we just pause To say that in an interview where you are talking about your partner of six years in an incident that resulted in her fucking death, the mother of your child is now no longer around and you are talking about all you wanted to do was have sex. It is so fucking disgusting to me and I hate everything about it. Russell continued, all I wanted to do was come home stuff. I know that Friday is going to be a very hectic day for me. Everything's going to be packed. My father's coming to pick me up early Saturday morning. I'm going to be out of here by seven at 10. I'm on the plane and I'm doing my thing. I'm doing a dream. She didn't want me though. He then keeps going on and on about the shower and about the conversation. He said it was not, it was not argumentative. It was not vicious. It, most of it was based on this conversation that she had with Craig. Oh, I talked to him. Oh, I did this. Oh, everything else. Fine. You know, I don't have the buttons that you can push to maybe want to put me into that mode. We're just sitting, talking, talking, not a big deal. Phew, you know, it's it's one thing to see something on television. It's another thing to come home on the verge of what you're doing and everything else. And then the person, a person, the person that has been part of your life for six years that you, I trained her. I gave her the skills in the restaurant to do desserts. I gave her a sense of, and it's unclear what he said. 
but she comes home. I'm sure you've checked her out. She comes from a very unstable, shitty background, one of which that I don't come from. Obviously, you guys don't come from that. But when we met at the Crescent Hotel, I would see her. She would come in. And I'll never forget that statement that you and uh, the other detective, Gary, and they reply, Saravo, Saravo, okay, when you guys came into me, you came to my house and you said Stephanie's mother or Stephanie's sister has told you that on at least 50 occasions that I had beaten her. I never in six years ever raised a hand. That is something. That's a way of trying to put this picture together and lay shit on me. I'm just going to breeze through this because this part's pretty consistent. He talks about how he's sitting on the center of the couch. She walks out and says, Russell, I'm going to shoot you. She fires a shot. She cocks the gun. She walks off to the bedroom. Then Russell states that he goes and he follows her. And he says, "Uh, I go through the hall. I walk through the door. It's three quarters of the way closed. I open the door. I take a step. I'm in the bedroom. I know I told you guys of this fight. I know I told you guys of this confrontation, of this struggle. I really don't think, and I am not excluding that maybe it did or did not happen. And that's the point of like darkness for me. I don't think there was a struggle. The struggle was my own struggle. I wanted to. I wanted to grab her. I wanted to stop. What did you shoot him? Stop the madness? Why did all this happen? You never gave me the chance. I don't know what the fuck that means, but what I can tell you is that I would bet everything that I have that this dude knows what the fuck happened. He knows whether there was or was not a struggle, and he knows who touched the gun. Investigators say, okay, what happened? Russell stated, I don't know what happened. I don't know what happened. I may know. It'll come to me. I never, I don't think I ever put my hands on her. Investigators ask why and Russell stated that he saw her fall from a distance. Yes, I saw her legs buckle. They asked how Stacy fell. What is most interesting to me about this piece that I'm about to read in his response is that he can't remember if there was a struggle. He can't remember anything. It was all darkness. Very melodramatic answer. But this is a very concise and detailed statement that he's about to give. They asked how she landed. Her head. Because she was in the corner. She was in the corner and the corner was created because the television sat there and the closet. She was standing right there. She just went limp. The life was gone from her. They then asked when she was hit, was she on her front, on her back, on her side? Russell stated, her head. Her head hit the television, the knobs on the television, and then it hit the table because the table was on top. The television was on top of the table and her head went onto the table. She landed on her back. She landed on her back. And I saw all of this and it was just God. No, this isn't part of reality. This isn't my life. Too much, too much. And I looked. I kind of knew she was dead, but I didn't want to accept it. I had big stuff to get to her. I don't know what that means, but he states, and I took the steps and she's laying there and there's a lot of blood and the gun is right next to her. And my first reaction was, wait, take the gun, put it over here, which is exactly what I did. And I stood there for a second and something clicked off in my mind that, no, you can't do that, Russell. So I took it back and I set it back down and I went down to one knee and I lifted up her head. It was almost to pick her up. Come on, get up. No, come on, get up. And I set her head back down. There are several contradictions. Again, there's a lot of differences between him putting the gun in the holster and then putting everything in the closet. Then he didn't. Then he's unsure of the holster. Now he just moved the gun, but then he put the gun right back. But I think what's interesting is he specifically states that he knew that Stacy was dead, but his first instinct was to move the gun. Was it to move the gun to make sure that if she wasn't dead, she couldn't grab the gun again? Because you just firmly stated that you knew she was dead. So what was the purpose of touching the gun? In my opinion, it was probably to explain why your fingerprints would be on the gun. They point out the fact that he has made several, several different statements. And at this point, he clams up. His responses are, uh-huh, 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 okay. They point out all of the different discrepancies. They point out how he's been almost impossible to get in touch with. They've left him voicemails. He's just been really unresponsive. A statement that I found to be kind of alarming, and I don't know if this is the investigator trying to butter Russell up to get a confession, but I kind of found it to be a little bit more not copacetic. The investigator says, okay, I've tried calling you. You moved. You promised me you'd give me your phone number as soon as you got a new one and that you had the phone. You just didn't recall it. You never returned that. Um, you know, we've gone out of our way. I mean, we've bent over backwards to show that it was an accident for you. They then go on to try to coax Russell to speak, or I don't really know what 
but they talk about how Russell initially agreed to a polygraph, but he canceled his polygraph. The investigator further states that uh, the reenactment, which would have helped the detectives get a better grasp of exactly how it happened, you canceled that. You've become not intentionally or whatever, but uncooperative up to a point, which is leaving you and leaving us with a real problem here. They then continue to ask more questions about the events, and they say she drops somehow. Do you hear the shot or do you see the shot? Do you see her pull the trigger? Russell states, I can't see her hands, even though in the prior interview, the first interview, he firmly stated with attitude, oh my God, she's right handed. It was in her right hand. Investigators ask why, and Russell stated, because it was dark. And they confirm it's dark so you can't see her hands. And he said, yes. What I think is interesting is the fact that he was able to explain in vivid detail how Stacy fell to the floor to the point where he stated that her head grazed on the knobs of the television before it hit the table and she hit the floor. Yet, it's so dark that he cannot see her hands. On October 20th of 1993, Spokes met with Saravo at the county attorney's office where they reviewed the case with attorney C. Hastings. Attorney Hastings suggested that a psychologist should review Russell's various statements to police and ask for an opinion. If known information was revealed via the psychologist, Hastings suggested that he would consider the investigation complete and would make a charging decision at that time. Stacy's funeral service was held earlier on July 12th of 1993, and after the investigation by Sedona Police Department, the Yavapai County Attorney's Office refused to press charges due to an alleged lack of evidence. Nikki's younger sister went on to live with her father, Russell, and Russell moved on to have another family. On June 15th of 2020, Detective Dominguez met with Wendy, Stacy's sister, Nikki's aunt, regarding Stacy's death. Obviously, the family believes to this day that Stacy was murdered. However, as of today, nothing has come out of that. In fact, there were two articles that I'm going to link in the show notes that involved Detective Dominguez being interviewed regarding this case, and he was immediately removed from the case during the timeline of those two articles being released. What do you think happened that night in terms of the disagreement and the weapon? Well, Ashley, I tell you right off, I know my mom didn't grab the gun first and fire at Russell because that would mean that she was firing towards her daughter's bedroom, my bedroom, that first gunshot or the second gunshot, however, whatever, because there were two gunshots fired. I can tell you right now, my mom never popped off either one of them. It just never happened. He found out about the conversation with my dad, whether she volunteered the fact that she talked to Craig for 107 minutes or there was a recorder or he did because there was another call to my dad at 1120. Right when Russell's coming home from work, somebody calls my dad again. Was that Russell star 69ing or redialing, finding out that my mom called Craig? I don't know. We never will know who volunteered the information or how it got into the conversation, but he will readily admit that their conversation turned heated over her conversation with Craig, and he will bring up my dad's name more than the cops will ask him about it. He'll keep going back and circling back to Craig, and they don't seem to like catch on that that that's like a real sensitive point for him is the Craig conversation. Where did things take a turn for the worst and where was the ball dropped in this case? Oh, just from putting the children in the back of the squad car with the suspect right then. That's where it just started to fall apart. You could see right there that they weren't equipped to handle a homicide when putting the suspect with blood on his hands in the same cop car as the children where he was allowed to touch me and fondle on me. They let him sit in the clothing for up to six hours while they interrogated him before they made him change clothing. They never took gunpowder residue off his hands. The missed opportunities pile up just within the first few minutes of them arriving on scene. Let's not even talk about and tear apart the last 30 years that they have fallen apart and neglected my mother. At this point, I'm more upset at the organization that has neglected to prosecute the man that murdered her than the man that murdered her in a split second crime of passion. I, I, I don't even know how to answer that in a, a logical way because I'm so frustrated over decades of inaction. In what ways has your mom's passing impacted your life as well as the rest of your family? Oh, it completely shattered it. I, um, because of it, I have the doctors call it borderline post-traumatic stress disorder because I didn't see my mom murdered, but I relived the events of the cops walking through the home. I have anxiety. I have panic disorder. I'm always waiting for the other shoe to drop. Uh, 
my mom was murdered when I was a little kid. That was like the worst thing that you can imagine, right, as a child. So for the rest of my development life, I'm always waiting for like my father to drop dead or my animals to die. I'm always waiting for somebody to die on me. So I will specifically pick fights with friends and people I love to make them leave before, you know, they actually leave me. I will, I will pick that and I will leave the relationship. I don't have friends. It's really hard for me to keep relationships because I'm always worried about the people eventually leaving me. So I always leave first and I always start the fight. It's something I'm really bad about. And it's something that I'm really trying to work you know, work on doing. And it's, it's really helping doing this investigation. I didn't even realize that I was doing it or I was a hateful person until I started reading my mom's case file at the age of 38 years old. Nikki and her aunt, Wendy, wrote to the Yavapai County Attorney's Office, all of the attorney generals in Arizona, the Department of Justice, who actually sent an FBI agent to Wendy's house. But unfortunately, they were unable to take over the case without the cooperation of Sedona Police Department, who rejected their help. To this day, the Sedona Police Department have been unable to get in contact with Russell Bennett Peterson, as has Stacey's family. No charges have ever been brought against him. If you had the chance to speak to Russell or if he were going to listen to this interview, what would you say to him? Just admit what you did. Just admit what you did. If it was up to me, I would let you go without a day in prison if you just admitted what you did. I would stop trashing your name. I would stop putting your picture on Internet. Because I will hunt you for the rest of my life until you admit what you've done. This is not over for me. This has just begun. I waited 28 years. You got to live a whole life. Now it's time to pay for what you took. Just admit what you did. Be a man. And that's my message to Russell Bennett Peterson. How do you honor your mom's memory in your daily life? Every day. Every day now. She consumes me. And when I printed off her case file, um, I was an active addict. And it took me 17 days in reading her case file before I will quit cold turkey. I have not turned back to drugs since then. My mom keeps me sober. I owe her this because she keeps me sober. This keeps me sane because otherwise I would go insane after reading about what happened to my mom and the injustice that keeps occurring. And I'll tell you something else, too. How do I honor her? For years, I refused to go to her burial site. I thought it was just a name on a wall. I said she wasn't there. And within the last month, I have visited my mom's crypt and it became like the most spiritual thing. And now I can't wait to go back. And I put flowers there and um, I honor her by keeping her memory alive daily and speaking on the fact that she was shot and killed by her boyfriend during a domestic violence altercation and no charges were ever filed. What can listeners do to help? Oh, sign the petition, please. Oh, ooh, that would make me so excited. The link is on my bio page on TikTok under my profile picture, or I'm sure Ashley will put it in the show notes. Please sign the petition. It's to present a complete case file to a grand jury of our peers. Put this before a grand jury and let a grand jury of our peers decide if there's enough evidence to prosecute Russell Bennett Peterson. Please sign the petition. And can you give everybody your TikTok handle? Yes, it's at Nicole Wasilishin 726. One more time, Nicole Wasilishin, W-A-S-I-L-I-S-H-I-N. So follow along and find out if this actually works. Stephanie, a.k.a. Stacy Marie Wasilishin, was a loving mother to two. She was a loving daughter. She was a loving sister. She was a loving friend. Rest in peace, Stacy. If you liked what you heard today, please like, review, subscribe. You can find me on all social platforms at FThatPod, except for Instagram, which is at that underscore pod. If you're looking for bonus content, all of my archived episodes, as well as early and ad-free releases, it is Patreon at FThatPod, and the website is FThatPod.com. <laughs>